Just to kind of get a feel, thank you, for who's in the room, um, because I know you had a choice of other talks to go to. Um, I'm thinking that maybe there's some people that work for larger organizations here, show of hands, yeah. I saw um, on, on the list of participants, we had some universities, some large consultancies, banks, so maybe some of you stayed in the room, knowing that we're from a larger organization. We might have some nonprofits and public sector as well here, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm Deirdre, this is Jonathan. Um, I'm from Ireland, from Dublin, and Jonathan's from Northern England. Uh, we, we live in Belgium. We have a great football team, Go Belgium, quarterfinals. Um, so we, we both work in, in the European Commission, we're civil servants, so staff in the European Commission. And Jonathan and myself have known each other since about 2007. Um, we've both worked on, on content, actually, in or around content. I was managing a large website, Europa.eu, um, the European Union's website, and Jonathan was working, I was in the communications department, Jonathan was working in the, in the translation department in an editing team. Um, so even before our digital change project began and had a name, we were out there trying to change things, trying to make a difference, um, and trying to link up as much as we could. So about a year ago, our organization put in place a digital transformation project, and today we'd like to talk you through a little bit about what were the factors that um, brought that project to life. Um, the European Commission we were about 24,000 staff, most of us based in Brussels. We're the largest of the EU um, organizations. We also have the bank here in Frankfurt, the court in Luxembourg. Most of Commission staff are in Luxembourg, but we also have offices around the world. Um, our core business is really to make legislative proposals, to oversee how legislation is implemented. We also channel a lot of funding, research funding, um, and we do a lot of policy coordination between the member states of the EU. So, so a broad range of tasks. Okay, I'm going to pass over to Jonathan. Yeah, so today we want to describe a little bit what we're actually going to be doing over the next, over the next few years. It's probably going to be that long a, a program, I imagine. And right now, we're kind of at base camp. So if, if you're climbing Everest, there's this place, base camp, where you, you, you climb, you get used to the altitude before you really do the steep climb. And we've we kind of feel, it feels as if we're about there, about to set off really to get stuck in. But for the last year or so, we've been piloting and prototyping and laying down some of the foundation work for, for what we're going to do. And we kind of know where we want to get to. It's this utopia where we grow useful, usable content starting from the seeds of user needs and, and business goals. So that's where we want to go, and we want to take the organization with us. And it's a big organization, as Deirdre said, so it's, it's quite a challenge. And of course, we know that the sun is always going to be shining, the sea is always going to be blue, and the path's going to be easy, and the obstacles are going to be manageable. <laughs> we live with optimism in our hearts, but we know that there are some really steep climbs up there, and, and one of those climbs is, um, is, I think, going to be how to handle the transition between the old and the new when you're creating a new environment and uh, you've got the old one already existing there. That's going to be very challenging. And, um, sorry, mm -hmm. just one of the things is, one of the goals as well, is to kind of figure out where content, stra where content strategy fits in this picture because it's not yet clear to us. Our definition is not yet narrowed down, and it was very useful to see the list um, that we saw this morning. So a little bit about the team. Um, so the commission in total has about 40 different departments. We're structured a little bit like a civil service, um, dealing with lots of different areas. I mentioned some of them earlier, so like trade, also humanitarian aid, development, social unemployment, education. So we have 40 departments and six agencies, um, and the digital transformation team uh, actually, we come from three departments, but we're working to help support the organization as a whole. Um, so we come from three departments, comms, communication, where I come from, Jonathan's uh, translation departments, um, and also our IT departments, who of course are, are really key players, not least as we're about to transition to a new uh, corporate CMS um, in the next year. So we've got comms, IT, and uh, translation coming together, because of course, Multilingualism is a big issue for us. We operate in up to 24 languages. 
So we're, we're departments that would have come together over the years, but it's the first time that we've really been put together as a team, and that really helps us um, when we're dealing with the other organizations. Um, we're a mix of, of civil servants, so um, commission staff like myself and Jonathan, and we're also lucky to have some private sector specialists as well. So we have information architects embedded in our team. Um, we have a very small um, usability team as well. When we began, when we were given a mandate um, back at the start of 2013, or we, we had our first day of, of operation in, at the start of May 2013, we were around 50 people, um, and that's double now. So we're 30 people. We're really not huge. If you think our organization has over 20,000 staff, we're still pretty small, and we're operating in a very complex environment where um, we have web, so we have communication teams in each of our departments, but up to now, they would have operated in a fairly decentralized way, so we'd have decentralized budget. We would have some guidelines and standards, but ultimately, people have been working in a very siloed way. Here we are in the flesh. So our role is really to, it's an ambitious one, it's to really change how the European Commission serves and communicates with its users online. Um, our goal is to really to steer in uh, the creation of a new web presence, to so to transform our web presence. And our keywords really are to be more relevant, to be more coherent, and to be more cost effective as well. Very important given the current financial climate. So we should come to work every day feeling like this. Great job, great task ahead of us. But the reality often kind of feels like this, actually. Um, it's tough out there in the field. So I mentioned we were going to say a little bit about kind of looking back on this path that we've walked up to base camp um, and, you know, how has the climb been so far and what, what were really the factors that led to, to the creation of this program. You know, all of us here were facing that rapid change. You know, we'd social added to the mix, so it wasn't just about publishing on your websites. Social came along big time, got a big interest with senior management. We had mobile arriving at the same time. We started to develop mobile versions of our sites. Departments started to want to create apps as well. I'm sure this is familiar to everybody here. So we had that rapid change going on. At the same time, we had some real pioneers in our organization, some real kind of trailblazing projects that were happening across departments. This is um, a, a website that we have for helping people with very practical things. So I want to go abroad. My child wants to do an Erasmus exchange abroad. I want to um, buy, uh, I want to buy my car in a different country. So really practical advice. And there's actually 14 departments working behind this content. And the nice thing is that the user doesn't need to know the history of, of the whole legislation that led to this. They don't really need to know what department is responsible. So we had some pioneering projects that myself and Jonathan would have supported me from more of a usability viewpoint, and Jonathan would have helped on the content editing. It also really helped us to bring the outside perspective in as well. Um, I did the first user test for the commission back in 2008. It was a real kind of eureka moment, as you say in German, observing and watching our first kind of user test and realizing that's absolutely what we needed to do. As much as we try to write intelligent labels or write clear content or design navigation, when you actually saw your users using your content and, and, and interacting with those labels and navigation, it was a bit of a wake-up call and very humbling for us. So we'd, we'd demonstrate with senior management, we'd show gaze plots, the eye tracker before and after, we'd run usability tests, this is an observation room, we've got a live usability test down the corridor, all on a very kind of small guerrilla scale, but every test we ran, we tried to invite people in. Um, we also brought our management to visit other um, projects. This is a visit we did to gov.uk um, with, our, with our manager, who's talking to the team there. So we went and we, we met with other teams that were going through um, similar, uh, similar change and transition, and we found that helped. Um, we also had a series of speakers in. Sometimes it helps if you get people from the industry in, especially to talk to management. Um, we had Lou Rosenfeld come to visit, Paul Boag from the UK, and, and Jerry McGovern. I guess a lot of you have, have heard of Jerry already. Yeah. Um, so Jerry is a great man for kind of calling a spade a spade um, and telling you uh, what you need to do in pretty plain language. So um, Jerry really came in and, and spoke to our senior managers and really, you know, emphasized this idea of just letting people do quickly and easily, you know, what they've come to your websites before. So really kind of trying to flag up the whole idea of kind of user needs and a pragmatic focus. And then, of course, you know, changes to technology, um, changes taking place, other digital cleanup projects, and all of this taking place with the, you know, the reality of um, cutbacks in budget, cutbacks in staff, realizing that we'd have to be more efficient about how we communicated online. Yeah, and one of the, one of the other factors that really led to, this, to the creation of this digital transformation team 
was the growing realization that our decentralized publishing model was, was producing a vast amount of websites and content in a very fragmented way. And there was actually no overview at all, no strategic overview whatsoever. There was no content strategy. And we currently have around 440 websites. And that's after cutting. Um, and obviously, that produces for the, oops, can I borrow yours? Am I working? Thank you. And that obviously produces for the users uh, quite a, a problem with coherence, so that you might have you know, one website on air passenger rights, useful for that Icelandic volcano. And you've got another one, and another, and another app on mobile. So you've got these two things saying completely different navigation system that people have to get used to, and also saying similar things, but subtly different. So actually, it, it doesn't create clarity. It, 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 uh, it can, it can create confusion at its worst. It's also tricky for editors, too. And it is often, in this environment, felt like a very uphill, slow struggle to try and actually do some bottom-up strategy, you know, to do ad hoc strategy when a, when a piece of work comes in, of, of editing work, which is what I've been doing, to try and actually rather than looking at the text in isolation, to see where this fits into the overall picture. That's not an ideal position to be in. And this is why it's felt very, very hard, very much hard work. And, and you know, the kind of texts that we, we get, I've chosen a particularly bad example here uh, that's not really uh, typical. But this, you know, when this lands on your desks, it actually is 13 pages long. And it's, con it's seen as a single web page. You can see it's uh, very much a print-based mentality with a table of contents. And it's very organization-centric. So this, this is talking about what the commission has done uh, in a particular field of policy with other international organizations. 13 pages all on that. And it's very difficult as an editor to take a strategic point of view, because the one thing that's lacking is knowledge about what the users really want. And if you don't have that key piece to start with, it's very difficult to figure out what the focus should be. So sometimes you're tempted to just say, the whole thing should just go. <laughs> and of course, then you ask people, well, why should it be online? And, and they'll come up with all sorts of uh, reasons, which are probably very familiar to you. Maybe the one that's not familiar to, to most organizations is this. We have to have this online by law. There are actually laws, European laws, when European Parliament decides that a piece of a particular need should be fulfilled online. But, um, and the job is then to figure out how that need, legitimate though it might be, is best, is best fulfilled. And it's not necessarily by creating a new website. Or even by creating new content. It might already be there. So this is kind of, when we're editing and doing, this is kind of what the content owners think we're doing. You know, they, they produce this beautiful piece of content that says beautifully how, what they've been doing over the last five years. And they, want, they send it to us thinking we should, just, we should just polish it and make it a bit nicer and present it better. And to us, it feels a bit more like this. You know, there's huge amounts of stuff out there trying to get, trying to clean up this enormous array of content. It's an uphill struggle. So that was, that was the work, in a way, in the, in the, in the previous years. And, and in the last year, we came together and created this, this uh, digital transformation team in the hope, with the aim and ambition of creating a more strategic, taking a more strategic approach to content. And we've done a lot of work. We've closed 90 sites. We've, uh, we've deleted uh, 750,000 pages. We've brought in user-centric methodologies at, at every stage. So we've been using, for the first time in many cases, card sorts, tree jacks, uh, and just and user testing of the kind that Deirdre mentioned. We've been making connections with all of these different departments and trying to see where their commonalities are. What, what, what is it they have in common? Which tasks, which user tasks do they, are they involved in? And also, we need to grow our own content strategists, because we realize it's not, it's not easy to just take one off the shelf, because there aren't that many of them formed. And we need to come to our own definition. And we need to figure out what they should be wearing as well, because actually, that is, that is, quite, a, that is quite a thing in the commission. I mean, I'm not wearing jeans and 
You know, um, <laughs> there's a reason for that, perhaps. Uh, one thing that didn't work so well for us was content auditing. We, and I think that's partly because of the volume of content with over 2 million content pages at the time. Uh, it's, and also, it's difficult to know what we would use the audit for because we, we hadn't yet really got a clear idea of, of where we were going and what that destination was. So we weren't sure what criteria we should assess the quality by. So Jonathan has talked you through a little bit about the work in the first year of the team's operation. So, you know, we, we've done a lot of climbing and there's been a lot of mud on the path. Um, it's been difficult, but, you know, here we are at base camp um, getting ready for probably the steeper climb, actually, that's ahead of us um, as we really embark on, on the transformation to a single web presence. Um, base camp is a good place to kind of uh, assemble your team and to acclimatize and to prepare. And the one thing we felt we really needed, actually, was to really get a handle on that, on that data. We knew that to go forward, we would need to be much more kind of evidence-based and have much more of a, a good hold on what those user needs were. Um, and we also realized that we'd have to demo a little bit our vision as well. Um, so that, that's a little bit what we've been working on, actually, since December, January. And I want to talk you through some of that now. So data to the rescue and our prototyping work. So this is a drawing that my colleague um, Helen did. Um, so basically, we decided to, to, to do um, an online poll where we'd really try to as an organization to understand what those user needs were. Um, I mentioned Jerry McGovern earlier. We worked with his company, Customer Care Words, um, and we kicked off this process back, back in December. So the idea being to do this poll, to find out what our user needs were. Um, and th this kind of poll has been done in many, many organizations. And very often what happens is your users are really interested in a certain number of kind of dominant tasks or top tasks, so we really wanted to find out what those top tasks were. Um, so this is a kind of sketch we did to, to explain to these 40 departments and six agencies what, what we were about to do. So this funnel here on the left um, is, is the kind of work we were doing last December and January, where we really looked across the whole organization to see you know, what is it that the reasons why people were coming to us. Um, we looked at what the main search terms were for all our sites. Um, we looked at what the most popular visited pages were. Um, we spoke to the people who answer our free phone line, um, Europe Direct, where people phone every day to ask questions about the EU and the Commission. Um, we looked at mission statements from departments to really get the kind of business goals in there. Um, uh, so all of that went into this kind of large funnel. Um, and we asked the departments to really feed us this information as well. And all of that came out in a kind of long, 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 long list of tasks, which was actually 1,700 tasks, so 1,700 reasons why people um, interact with our organization. Um, and we ran a series of, of workshops with the departments and agencies, 22 workshops in total, and we ran them between kind of January, um, January, February, and March. So very intensive process where we went through um, spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet um, to really try to crunch this down to a short list of what we hoped would be around 80 tasks, um, so 80 main reasons. So we cut out the duplicates. We merged different topics. Um, and we actually finally got to a list of 77 was our magic number. So 77 reasons why uh, people interact with our organization. Um, and we also got a lot of input from the departments on, on the audiences they were trying to reach as well, um, because obviously we wanted to poll with the right audiences too. Um, so we ran that poll. Uh, we released it on the, on the 25th of May, and we ran it for uh, almost three weeks. Um, and I'll talk, to, talk you through a little bit about how the polling well, went. Um, and we actually have the results now, and we're in the boardroom next Friday presenting those results to our senior management. So spreadsheet after spreadsheet, content strategists will be familiar with Excel. Um, this is what the poll looked like online. Um, it was very short. The main question being, can you choose the five main reasons why you might want to interact with our organization? Uh, we ran it um, for a period of about three weeks. We, we got 107,000 respondents. We were actually delighted um, with the feedback we got. The last question we asked users, would you be happy to help us with further research? We didn't know what to expect here, but we, we are over the moon. 40,000 people left their details with us to say they'd be happy to help with further research. So it's given us a huge pool of future testers as well. 
It shows the willingness of our users to help us. Um, as well as running this external survey, we also ran a poll with staff. Um, and why did we do that? It was to really to try and kind of measure the empathy. So does the staff, and that's staff from all aspects, comms people, non-comms people, management, non-management, um, do the staff understand actually what the, what the users want? And is there any kind of discrepancy between them? Um, so we have the results out next week. It's a shame the conference isn't a month later and I could tell you everything, but what I can tell you is there are six tasks which are really, really dominating. Six tasks got 25% of the vote. Um, I can also tell you that there is a discrepancy between what staff think people are coming to our websites for and what people actually want from us as an organization, which is very interesting. Um, there's also what we were really pleased to see was that there's massive consistency in what people want from us. Um, it doesn't really matter what country they're in. Um, we ran this survey in, in all our 24 official EU languages. Um, we ran it in Irish as well. Um, so there there's, isn't actually much difference in terms of people's language, in terms of even the sector they come from. So huge consistency and a huge domination of, of a small number of tasks, and that's really going to help us go forward. Um, at the same time as um, getting at Basecamp, getting this uh, user research underway, we also worked on a, on a kind of demo. We really looked at our different content types. We really want to try and narrow down the, the number of content types that you can uh, publish. Um, so to really see patterns across departments and where we can make things more similar. Um, we, we've done a demo. Uh, we, we, we really started our demo or prototype of a new single web presence using real content. We didn't want to do Laura Mipsum. Um, and we've also had a really re rigorous cycle of user testing. We've had users on our corridor every second week um, testing, first of all, on paper, using eye tracking as well. So that's been a really nice uh, experience. So uh, that's what we take to senior management next week. It's a bundle of um, the user research results. It's the prototype to the demo of where we want to go forward and a kind of a concept and, and vision of where we want to go to. Yeah. So Deirdre's kind of talked about the fairly, well, the quite high level user needs. So just a list of 77 things that people might come to the European Commission sites for. And, um, and we need now to think, the real challenge is to think at a, at a more operational, concrete level, what, what those individual small needs will be. And we, we had that from, that was what fed into that funnel. So we have some idea about that, but we're still not sure how those fine grain needs translate into content. And I think that is going to be, that is going to be our definition of content strategist. It's converting those needs into, into, um, into a content strategy and also acting as the interface between that and the people who are writing, because we depend so much on content specialists uh, that we, you know, we don't have the expertise in all of these policy areas, but we're going to have to articulate how they can produce content to meet, to meet the needs. Um, I want to show you just an example that never was online. It's an internal communication example. And it's, uh, it's an email that we all got about heating our offices over the Christmas break. It was during a particularly cold winter. And they were obviously worried that we'd actually, you know, we might be found, you know, frozen to death on the, on the 27th of uh, December. So, so they sent around this email just saying, you know, check, check that your office is going to be heated if you're going to work over the holiday. If it's not, uh, this is the number to phone. And if you have any problems while you're working, it's too cold, this is the number to contact. Except that wasn't the email rece we received. This was the email we received. And, and this is kind of quite, this is quite representative of our, of our writing culture because it's, uh, these are highly trained lawyers, administrators who, have a very, you know, who are very attached to a, an academic and rigorous way of, of writing that does not correspond to web writing at all. And you can see, I mean, I don't, and you don't, I don't think you need me to point out uh, where, where the room for improvement is. It's, uh, you know, this is an interesting one, though. Again, in this year, in order to contribute to the reduction of the Commission's carbon footprint in Brussels, it's been decided, blah, blah, blah. You know, that is so true. I mean, it's a great goal, but it's, it's not the user's goal. The user's goal is to, is to get their office heated when it's cold. That is the reason for sending this email round and the whole approach, but it doesn't need to be stated to the user. There are you know, difficult things about clarity, and, and we're very good on jargon. So things like here are the, the, you know, 
due to the inher uh, inherent thermal inertia of buildings, which means you know, they've got some insulation in them. Uh, and again, it's not necessarily what people need to, need to know. So it could be a lot shorter, and it could be just a lot, generally, a lot simpler. So that was the, that was the edited version, and that was the original. And it's a bit mean to pick on an email because this, you know, obviously this was done in a hurry and sent out, and it, and it fulfilled its purpose. And it's fine for that, those purposes, but obviously if you're communicating with the public, that's not, that's not good enough. A really interesting uh, thing, I think, is, is to compare the text I got starting from the user need to my initial edit, which was based on a kind of summary mentality. So I was trying to reduce, I was trying to take out the information that wasn't so useful, but I was thinking about summary. And then when I did it again, I thought, actually, what do people really need? You get to an even shorter thing. And I think we want to, you know, we want to make sure that our content strategy is really use, rooted in user needs and that we explain to editors how to how to translate that into really focused content. So obviously, the user story is one thing that we're thinking about how to use. You know, so it just says who, what, and, and why. This is, one of the ways, this is one of the ways we can interface with, with user needs and, and, uh, and, and writers. Deirdre. OK. Thanks, Jonathan. So, um, Kind of looking a bit forward, uh, where is it we'd like to go if we were to come back in a year's time? Um, what would we have liked to achieve? Um, Belgium will have won the World Cup, of course. Um, as a next step, we'd really like to, to use this solid data of, us of uh, our user needs and the evidence we've got from our survey, which was organization-wide, to really build a new web presence, to really um, use this uh, to prioritize those kind of main tasks and those main reasons why people are coming to our sites. Um, so really using this data to help us actually build the architecture. Um, we'd love to be in a place in a year's time where we don't just have user stories, but we have really good quality user stories um, as a basis for our content. As John Jonathan said, it's so important that we give like, a clear steer and a clear briefing for our editors. It's not just about summarizing content. It's really getting um, to the core of those needs. Um, and we'd like to have some clear content types um, to help us with our new CMS. Um, We'd love to see the first uh, cross-departmental teams shipping some good content. We will be there as facilitators, as the kind of fulcrum, as one of the speakers said earlier. Um, and we also think we need to do more of the kind of relationship building in the organization as well. Um, there's very important conversations we need to have with IT teams um, in our organization too. A lot of our websites have informational content, but many of them have complex back-end systems as well. It's probably the same in a lot of your organizations, and that conversation really needs to be had. Um, we have, for example, very complex um, funding application mechanisms, but of course there's a front end that the user has to, has to do. So the, the micro content of, of labels, of navigation around those um, back-end applica applications are really important. So we feel stronger links. We'd like to strengthen the links more with our colleagues working on social media as well, build bridges, HR too, um, because we're worried about some of the skills gaps that we see in the organization. And we know we need to invest more time in internal communications. We do do a bit of blogging. We try to go to speaking events kind of internally, but we feel that we really need to put more emphasis on that because after all, this is a big change project. So we'd like to, to our, our journey to really bring us to a place um, where our content is, is truly rooted in, in user needs, and it's not just about the need of the organization to put everything it does online all the time. Um, we'd like to move to a place which isn't based on kind of personal opinions or on assumptions, which I think um, a lot of our content is coming from at the moment, to really make it more evidence-based. Um, we really want to try to kind of foster that collaborative work and, and the shared content, and I think that's going to be um, a very steep climb, actually, for departments who've been really used to working on their own in siloed. But getting people to realize it's not just about their content, it's about um, making it coherent and, and acting as a single organization. Um, and we want to le leave that culture, which is about um, boom and bust cycles of new websites every two years, and really focus on kind of incremental improvements and getting better the whole time. So that's it. We've shared a bit of our journey and where we've come to in the last year. Um, try to, to share with you some of our learnings. Um, and we're around for the next day and a half. We're happy to also hear from you and your experience, because I think all of us have a lot to learn together. So thanks. Thank you.